There was a movie theater across the street where I grew up. As a child, I would sit on the balcony for hours, watching couples as they came out of the theater, making up stories about their life and relationships, based on how they touched each other or looked at each other. As an adult, I changed this fascination with relationships into a profession. And for the past 30 years, I've seen couples as a marital therapist and clinical psychologist. So what is it about this institute called marriage that we so desire and fantasize about, and yet it often fails so miserably in reality? The divorce rate is about 52%. The infidelity rate is at 40% the admitted infidelity rate. So think that at least 40% of your married friends have cheated or will cheat in the near future. None of you, of course. <laughs> I'm a believer in marriage. People who are married can give each other a lot of support and strength and happiness. Yet, with time, some of them, in the name of love, can also be critical and hurtful and controlling as if they own the other person. And I've learned through my encounters with couples that there are many good explanations for this behavior, but there is one beyond all that, and that is our tendency to take each other for granted. Just because we, as a married couple, think that we are going to be together forever. Marriage is a signed contract for life. When have we ever signed on a contract that did not have an exit date? How can we have no problem signing a life-binding contract regarding our own marriage, promising happily ever after and as long as we both shall live? What are we thinking? Well, we are thinking that we are very unique and our marriage will keep for a lifetime. Why? Because at the beginning, the idea of being together for life is very attractive. It represents the deep meaning of marriage, and it also makes us feel safe. Yet, this eternal promise can turn like a double-edged sword, and we can become vain and indifferent. So I thought to myself, if this is what we understand, why not change the rules of the game? And so I develop what I call a re-choosing agreement. Imagine, on your wedding day, you will take a marital vow that states that this commitment is not forever. That in fact, the vow that you will make is for your relationship to be evaluated in seven years. You and your spouse will commit yourself to a re-choosing agreement. And this means that in seven years' time, you will evaluate your relationship together, and for your marriage to continue, you will both have to actively choose each other again. And this process should repeat itself every seven years. Well. I can only imagine the kind of thoughts that run through your minds right now. Like, what kind of an idea is it? It's not realistic. And why examine the relationship at all? And why seven years after the wedding? This is an awful timing. By then, we probably have young children and a mortgage to worry about. Apparently, when we know that we are being evaluated, we are much more motivated. You know, it happens to us in schools and at work, and marriage, most of the time, is the most complicated and delicate work of it all. And as for timing, you know, it takes only one person who wants a divorce for the divorce to happen. And it can happen at any time. And it's never a good time. 
yet it takes two to maintain a good relationship. And so ironically enough, the re-choosing agreement can keep our marriage alive because it's an awareness that stays in our mind like a little light to remind us not to take each other for granted. So what is in this re-choosing agreement? Well, actually, it starts prior to the wedding day. And it can also be relevant to married couples. Let's look at uh, Dan and Tammy, a couple, who came to me in order to resolve some conflicts in their relationships. And in one of the sessions, we decided to build together such an agreement. And so I asked each of them to write down the moral values that are most important to them. And Tammy came and asked for honesty and trust. And then came with being a vegetarian and a need for respect. And although there was nothing new to them, it elicited a very deep and interesting conversation. And then I asked them to write down their expectations from each other, which is not simple. And Tammy asked for his mother not to come over every day. <laughs> and he asked for more sex and also for more personal time for himself. And so that led to more topics and more discussions. And eventually, they succeeded to come up with a mutual list of wishes that they both agreed upon. So now they know what works for them and they can enjoy it. And seven years from now, they will sit together and evaluate their relationship through the eyes of who they will become. Well, if they will be happy, they will choose each other again. And that's great. But if they will not, then they will discuss it and decide what to do. Maybe they can solve it by themselves. Or maybe they should take uh, a professional help. Or maybe on extreme cases, they can go for a trial period of separation. Or perhaps they might decide to take the exit point in their relationship. Well, when I tell people about the exit point, some react with joy and relief. Like, wow, that can really help my marriage. Did you say seven years? Well, that means I have two more years. Or some of them also react with a paralyzing fear, the fear of abandonment. And I know about this fear. But what about that abandonment and the misery that people feel within their relationship? Can't that be more harmful at times? As one man told me, when I tell my wife about an offensive event that happened to me at work, she blames me for it. And she tells me that I was wrong. And I end up feeling even worse. Or a woman who's been married for 20 years that tells me, well, he gave me the silent treatment again. He did not speak to me for two weeks. And I don't even know what I've done wrong in his eyes. Yet throughout this time, he was just so nice to our dog. And these stories are nothing compared to the deep scar that infidelity leaves in people. As one heartbroken woman told me, I don't know what lies and truth are. I don't know what love or hate are anymore. I don't even know if I want to kill him or myself. And so, the interesting question is, will these people able to change their behavior? And the answer is definitely yes. People can change. It is amazing to see how spouses, when they understand that they might not be chosen, can react as if they are awakening from a coma. They suddenly find a job or they pay attention to their spouses, or they initiate sex again. 
because the awareness makes us feel that our partners are more valuable and then we enjoy our relationship more. And I must confess, thinking about the re-choosing agreement regarding my own relationship brings up a mixed feelings of joy and some worry. And so I get up every morning and I choose my partner once again because I learned from personal experience that relationship can always change. And sometimes they need my full being. And when I'm there, I enjoy my relationship much more. So I try to stay aware and alive because it is my belief that staying alive is like staying in love. Thank you.